I feel like when you coached me, you were really strong. And now it's just ridiculous. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Today we are joined by Bryce Lewis from The Strength Athlete. Hey Bryce. Hello. Hey guys. How's it going? Good. So for those people who've not heard of you before, Bryce, I want to ask you about the very first client you ever coached. <laughs> can you remember who that was? <laughs> really yes, putting you I on can. the spot here. You can. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was you. We, it was. Uh, Eric. It was. Eric Helms and I uh, co-coached you when I was interning for Eric. Yeah. I'm so glad you didn't just go, yeah, I do. It was this, um, this girl <laughs> I was coaching, and I like something completely different. Yeah. So that, that was my first experience with being coached online. And I guess your mm -hmm. first experience of, you'd been a client of Eric's for a while by that point, right? I had, yeah. Uh, for bodybuilding first and then for powerlifting after that. And that was your, like... I guess you, we probably had a similar thought of like, ah, oh, online coaching's cool. I like being coached online. I'm going to start coaching online, mentored under Eric, and then the strength athlete was born. Yeah, yeah, not too far off from that. I was at a little bit of a crossroads and deciding if I wanted to go back for school because um, I had been a volleyball coach and volleyball coaching, unless you are like one of the top 10 coaches in the nation is not really a career that you, you can, you know, live off of and retire off of. And, and I was thinking, well, what do I want to do now? And so it was either go back to school or, you know, let me try out this uh, online coaching thing and see what that's like. Cool. That is really cool. I did not realize that Johnny was client number one. Did you? Not? Yeah. No. So Johnny, we, he was a, uh, a guinea pig. He's a test subject. Yeah. <laughs> and look what's happened to him now. <laughs> so, yeah, the, we, we last spoke to you, Bryce. It must have been five years ago on the fitness podcast. Uh-huh. Is that right? Five years yeah, ago. Yeah, I, I remember you wow. dropped some, some proper bombs on that one. Well, thank you. I, I don't mean you I don't know if that's I mean, changed since then. <laughs> yeah, quite a lot has changed. Um, what's so you've kind of told us about like the you were at crossroads you then were coached by eric and you kind of had this like oblique entry into online coaching what made you stick with online rather than doing in-person strength coaching mm -hmm. so i i never i never really did a whole lot of in-person work so i was a personal trainer for a little while um and that was a lot of fun and then i had some of my brother's wrestling clients as um as a strength training client so i would you know try to get them stronger in their off seasons for their wrestling careers but um i never really had kind of like a an in-person presence on that kind of stuff and my main experience and attachment to, to coaching was online, you know, because I had followed Lane and because, you know, I, I did some bodybuilding and, and, you know, bodybuilding coaching in the lens that I viewed from was, was online and, and so was powerlifting coaching. And, and that was kind of my entry into it. Um, whereas a lot of other athletes might not even see uh, online coaching is kind of a viable option right around 2013, 2014. It was kind of just starting to kind of come into its own as this field that you could actually create a career out of. So it looks like it was kind of the perfect storm as well, because you caught the wave of like, you were one of the first few like true online coaches that was doing it well and systematically with um, a kind of system, system set up from, from Eric and like I think the the model from from you coaching us I should I should mention like Bryce has coached both of us at some point yeah. um yeah. was quite similar to that model and you had a really strong personal brand and background of bodybuilding gymnastics even I think I remember seeing a, a video of you tumbling at some point um and powerlifting and I guess the the main question that a lot of people would be thinking now is like well that's fortuitous for Bryce, but he's an absolute beast and he's got these lifts and he's got such a strong personal brand on the back of him being such a good athlete himself. Do you have any advice for someone who is wanting to, let's say they're a PT now, they're wanting to build out an online presence, but they're not an incredible athlete and they want to be able to make themselves known? Yeah. 
So at, at the start, um, I, I was lucky to kind of have a large following on, on YouTube and a growing following on, uh, I guess, Facebook, because Instagram really wasn't big back then. Um, but even so, when I was thinking about doing this online coaching business, I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it to be about a brand and about values. And so I essentially locked myself in a room and for, for two weeks and just kind of came up with, uh, these are my values. This is kind of what I want our company to stand for. This is, um, this is kind of how I want to uh, portray us and, and just kind of be as professional as possible in terms of kind of outward appearance and yeah, systems. And this is how you sign up and, and all that kind of stuff. So for someone who is kind of coming to the space, I don't think that you need to be a professional athlete uh, or, you know, even a, an extremely high level athlete, probably having experience in the sport is a really good thing. Um, probably, you know, being able to talk, effectively and communicate effectively with your athletes is a good thing, but really take some time and think about what your values are. What do you stand for? What do you want your athletes to feel like when they work with you? Um, what are the kind of the things that you feel are really important to, to the coaching process or to kind of how you operate and use those to guide your vision? That was something that I, like, I certainly really felt when signing up with you, that it was very clear that you had, a guiding set of principles and values. And I don't know whether it was overtly communicated, but either way, like you were very clear about that. And I think it, it was, it was infectious. You know, you sign up and you're like, yeah, I'm part of this. Like, mm. and you felt you resonated with the same values as well. And I think it's probably an exercise that Johnny and I may, maybe need to sit down and do and kind of realign our, our values over time. Cause they've certainly changed over the last five to six, well, 10 years. <laughs> So um, I think getting clear on that makes the goals and the daily actions much easier because it's all yeah. moving towards that North star. Yeah, I agree. And, and I, I have to thank volleyball for that because I came from a club volleyball background and, you know, these, these kids are really fortunate. Like club volleyball isn't cheap. And so, you know, parents pay a lot of money to have their kids go to these clubs, but um in these clubs, you know, there's regimented practices, you've got, you know, specialist coaches for specific positions and, and, you know, this kind of structure and order. And I thought, well, I, I want, I want athletes to kind of feel that sense of we're covering all the bases. And that was kind of one of our, our guiding principles. And, you know, I don't, I still don't feel like we've hit that mark. You know, I mean, Ideally, I'd like for athletes to have access to a sports psychologist and a dietitian on a regular basis and kind of have those be like members of their team almost. And if they, if they end up feeling some kind of a, an injury or an ache and pain, it's okay, we'll go see, go see this person, tell them what's going on, and we'll kind of all interface behind the scenes and make sure things are all still headed in the right direction. In the same way that for a lot of big sports, that kind of thing is, is still being done. So I'd still like to head in that direction. So I guess that's in our future. I think the experience we both had with 3DMJ and then yourself, and I imagine you probably had the same thing working with Eric, was just this realization of, um, I guess, what is possible to experience as a client online. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people, when they, when they think about online coaching, they imagine being sent a PDF or you know, a very sort of hands-off experience. But certainly feeling like you have a coach in your corner, or in my case, I had like I had both Bryce and Eric um, in my corner helping me for a period of time. Um, and even though it's over email and it's kind of video replies and things like that, it is very much like wow, a lot can be a lot can be provided here. So, so I mean, mm -hmm. the idea, I remember you talking about this idea, like this, this sort of the genesis of the idea of, of having. I think you were going to have like a physio, right, and then physiotherapist, and then lots of as you say, yeah. a dietitian, like a team of people for people to access all online the idea of that is for especially for a powerlifter taking their sport more seriously for example which i imagine is the bulk of your market right now yes so it like, is yeah yeah so like for them to have that phenomenal resource so can you can you tell us a little bit about the evolution of tsa over the years so i suppose yusuf and i probably witnessed um you at the very start i can remember when it like I can remember seeing your logo for the first time and seeing you kind of branch out and make this into a brand and a, a business for the first time. So what was, how have things changed? I know it's a huge question, but have you always coached powerlifters? Has it always been all online? Has it always been the way that you've done it now? What are some kind of big changes that have happened over the years? 
It's, it's been primarily online. So I went from, um, you mentioned kind of getting video responses and kind of back when I was first getting coached, uh, video responses were kind of rare and mm-hmm. text-based responses were more common. And part of that has to do with the accelerating internet speeds and, you know, being able to upload videos pretty quickly now um, is kind of a, a trivial task. And, you know, I, I don't know a whole lot of athletes have gone through this, but sometimes when you get that first video message and you've been getting text-based uh, mm-hmm. communication back and forth, it's like, uh, you know, just going to HD communication, it just feels uh, amazing. Yep. And um, I've switched to basically only video updates un- unless I'm, you know, traveling and on a plane and can't do something like that. And and in those cases, it's kind of back to text, but um, bridging the, the gap of the internet is, is the most important thing I think these days, because what I want to do, if at all possible is get as close to being there with someone in person. Um, Because I think there's so much that we miss out on by, well, potentially miss out on by being coached online. And so I want to bridge that as much as possible by, um, you know, filming athlete responses uh, and, you know, kind of having them send me their training and me kind of demoing stuff uh, if at all possible and and getting back to them as well and and kind of updating their training. So um, that's one thing that's changed is kind of switching to, to video replies and then just kind of automating some of the more boring stuff uh, in the business so that you don't have to worry about it and it doesn't kind of bog you down. Um, some of these things are, are really mundane. I don't know if your listeners will really um, benefit from them, but we, we switch to recurring uh, billings instead of sending out a PayPal invoice one at a time. And oh, that saved a, a ton of <laughs> time. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the other thing, uh, I was just on the tip of my tongue. Oh, sending sending money to the coaches who I work with. Uh, it used to be that a client's money comes in, and then I send that out uh, once. Like at, for every time we get a payment, I send one right back to the coaches. And I've switched to kind of uh, every week, um, kind of having this sheet that tallies all that stuff and just tells me what to send. And that's also been um, kind of a huge time save as well. Oh, that's just so, so that, important. That kind of frees me. Like yeah. If- when you're working online, especially when you're self-employed, like we were saying this the other day, that you are the accounts department, you're the marketing department, you're the, de- the delivery, you're the sales. Like, and so any part of this, this manual compounds so much. And especially when you've got 40, 50, 100 clients, it becomes a colossal task and it detracts from the core competence, which, which, is, which is coaching people. So I think it's a no-brainer for that. And a lot of, I'm still seeing a lot of coaches that either – bill manually, as you said, and not benefit from the recurring billing and the the technology of that. And also doing lots of calls as well, for example. And Mm -hmm. I personally think that, yes, the gold standard is in-person access to someone and being able to to work with them face-to-face. But I think the next level down is not actually calls. I think it is what you described, which is video responses and someone being able to send you a batched version of the week and saying, here's my training, here's my, um, here's how my week's gone and all of that. Because it allows them to sit and actually think it through, send you a unilateral thing that you can then take, work through it, formulate a response and send something that's much more considered back. And I think that generates a much better coaching experience as the client, even if the client first thinks that, oh, well, I just need calls or often it's not even the client it's the coach that thinks like i I can i can add more value to my clients by having two calls a week and it's like well that's two hours of your week that you've now that you now is just accounted for and Mm -hmm. it very quickly puts a hard cap on how many clients that they can take on or in our case years ago we would just try and take on more anyway and end up sleeping less which ultimately (laughs) results in a worse coaching experience for everyone yeah Yeah, I like the idea that, you know, when you have someone give a weekly update, they have to take the time to kind of process what happened and they end up kind of filtering it first before it comes to you rather than just kind of, um, I had a really bad day on day one, I had a really good day on day three, you kind of get this summarized version of of what happened. Um, And that tends to mitigate some of the highs and the lows that athletes go through. and probably get a more leveled response um, from from the coach too. That that kind of makes more sense as well. I'm 
I'm interested uh, because I've seen uh, a lot of kind of different approaches to how to update. So Joe Stanek, uh, one of our coaches, put out a poll on his Instagram story recently. And um, the, the question was, how do you, how do you interact with your coach? You know, um, and, you know, it was like an ABCD kind of thing. And uh, the options were, you know, by email, by Facebook Messenger, by a call. And like, I think 75% are messaging back and forth with their coach on a regular basis on like Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp. something like that. Oh, awful. <laughs> that's, I think it that's just, it strikes me as such a, like to yeah, insanity. I mean, you, you kind of have to be constantly available. And I, I worry about that both for the sake of the, the coach athlete relationship that's kind of always on type of coach athlete relationship. It's also no not thing as a diet emergency or a training emergency. Yeah. If there is, it's probably Warren's going to see a doctor going to a hospital. <laughs> so I, I totally agree. And that like that alone, when someone just takes their client messaging off WhatsApp and onto something that's dedicated, the amount of sanity and time that they regain is incredible. Cause if you've got your, mm-hmm. your client threads in the same archive as your aunt Gladys and your friends and it's, it's a bad yeah. way to live. Yeah. I mean, Gladys, she's sweet, but you know, we really just need to kind of keep this separate. That's just trying to increase their squat, in which case put her onto the client platform. Yeah. Well, exactly. (laughs) It's also, I think it's detached from like, why is someone signing up with you? Like, are they signing up with you to have someone to like definitely reply to their messages on WhatsApp or is it to have someone to guide them to the outcome they're trying to reach? And that usually is to say, Bryce, that's a, having someone check in more than weekly is kind of like looking at your weight daily, isn't it? And saying, Oh, I've, you have gained two pounds today. Therefore it's not working. Like you can't really say anything about a single mm-hmm. unit of data. It's more about what is the weekly summary or even like a fortnightly or a monthly summary really to make yeah. real decisions on does this act does, do we actually need to do anything here or is it just continue as we are continuing? Mm-hmm. So like communication more than weekly is, is almost worse, I think, for the client because it makes them focus on details that aren't actually relevant. I guess you have to ask yourself, what are what are your clients talking with you about on a more than weekly basis? And I think in, in the lens of powerlifting, it's probably load selection. You know, help me figure out what weight I should put on the bar. Um, and it's probably technique stuff. And on the more than weekly basis, I think the technique stuff might be micromanaging uh, in the sense of the type of technique changes that we're looking for in powerlifting are, are first off pretty small once you kind of know how to squat and know how to bench and know how to deadlift, uh, but also take a lot of repetitions to really sink in, you know, the type of repetitions you're not going to be able to kind of dramatically change your technique in a week's basis. So yeah. the, the other risk is that with powerlifting and with bodybuilders, the psychological profile of that kind of client tends towards obsessional style thinking and it's very Mm -hmm. easy to become neurotic as a powerlifter with technique adjustments or as a bodybuilder particularly you know pre-contest we've all been there Mm -hmm. or um you know end of a diet where you start like really mincing over your macros Mm -hmm. and so actually i think part of the role of a coach as you said is the psychology management and to then say you know what like we've set the goal let's just see how it goes this week and not worry about it in the meantime. Cause yeah, if you have a daily review, like <laughs> you just can't go on with your life. I can remember Bryce, when we, when we first worked together, I think the version of me that you encountered was like, I, Eric was, was reverse dieting me. And I was also prepping for a part my first ever powerlifting meet while working like really long hours. And mm-hmm. I can remember instances of like refreshing my email to see if Eric was going to give me an extra 15 grams carbs and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, it's insane yeah. what, like what just being in a dieted state of mind or like a prep state of mind can do, can do to you. And if your coach well, doesn't you, have established, yeah. like this is how we're communicating. This is how this works. You can see mm-hmm. how someone could be, be messaging daily with concerns and whatever, whatever kind of crosses their mind. I was going to say you weren't the only one that kind of learned from from that whole process. Eric and I have, have actually talked about kind of what it was like coaching you, uh, probably oh, a few years ago at this point. <laughs> oh, no. But but 
just kind of um so you you had great intentions but you you would see some new idea or some exercise or a training strategy or or you would come up with this on your on your own and say you know what do you guys think about this and and for the most part we would say yeah let's let's put it in you know so we started off with some program and and just kind of add and add and add and then 12 weeks later look back and be like what did we create you know this yep. is just some yep some blend of, of different things and, and how did we get here? And so that was a process for me, for sure, about knowing when to say yes and when to say, well, let's hold off and just kind of run this current experiment for a little while. Mm. Cats out the bag now. It's going to be the trailer of the podcast, like Bryce Lewis Bryce throws shade reveals. on Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're right though, Bryce. You're, you're 100% right. I can remember, I remember looking back on that period and thinking, man, I must have been, I must have been a difficult client. And I think like, it was the combination of, I think I learned a lot from that experience as a, like now as a coach, because I realized how even just a few things. So like busy, busy job and put lots of pressure at work with being in it, having been in a calorie deficit and pretty lean for quite a long period of time with prepping for a powerlifting competition seem on paper, really quite basic things that like a lot of people deal with. But that combination for me was, I just, I can remember it occupying so much of my headspace on a daily oh, basis, yeah. when you're hungry a lot, when training doesn't go very well, when you're worried about stepping on the platform for the first time. And then when you encounter a client who you kind of see going through that, you're like, okay, like rather than thinking, you know, what are they doing? You kind of, you, re- you spot these, these similar patterns, but yeah. You're, yeah. Like to see yeah, it that takes... clients as a human, and yeah. not just a set of numbers on a, on a spreadsheet. Absolutely. And it, I guess sometimes it takes going through that as a coach to say, okay, well now, now I have a new golden rule of anytime someone's going through a first competition, there's, there's no dieting, you know, or, you know, just kind of, you establish your, your values based on what you've been through as a coach. And and that's an ever evolving process, I guess. That was something you just have on the top of your laptop. Like whenever Johnny emails me asking about coaching sites decline <laughs> <laughs> reminder so you self. actually took me back i actually worked with you again since then so it can't have been that bad there's an example no. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't there's um there's an example of that as well when you were coaching me bryce which was uh, i think i was getting very goal oriented and very focused on like increasing my total and mm. you you yeah. gave you prescribed me 20 minutes of play time every session do you remember that <laughs> yeah yeah it was just like you said it's not all about your total just just play that was when you were dealing with back like the beginnings of the back pain right yeah it was so you just needed more play time then uh, uh, how, yeah. how has that it been is. the back it's it's been a it's been a funny journey i think um probably yeah. similar to a lot of your athletes where I just didn't like the bell was ringing my back with my, my L5 S1 was like, hello, hello. Can you mm. stop, please stop hurting me? And I was like, oh, it's fine. It'll be, it'll be okay. I'll just keep training on it. <laughs> and then I got to the point where it was, it was disabling and I actually lost sensory motor function across my S1 dermatome and myotome. Um, mm-hmm. And then that was the wake up call. I was like, okay, <laughs> I need to stop being a dick here and just give it some proper rest. And so I've, yeah. I've documented the back pain journey, but yeah, unfortunately, I, I didn't learn from my mistakes, but it's made me um, recognize that trait in clients. And if they're the kind of people that love to ram their head against a wall, mm. to be like, no, you're not allowed to deadlift for six months because this is more important. For sure. Yeah. Which is another part of client management that I think is sometimes you don't expect as an online coach, right? Like trying to accommodate injuries and um, issues that people have and like, oh, they can't just follow this squat bench deadlift program that I had written out. Like, actually, I really need to sit and problem solve this and think of a solution around this problem is again, something yeah. I think you don't, you don't immediately imagine when you think online coaching, you don't think I'm going to have to deal with this scenario. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, coaching, coaching is always fun in games when, you know, athletes are making tons of progress and training for them is, is really easy or you're dealing with, uh, beginner athletes or intermediate athletes who can make progress on, on much of anything. But I think you earn your worth when you're in those difficult moments and you're able to get someone out the other side, clear, uh, injury free, and, you know, still liking the sport, you know, kind of the, the three dangers that I worry about when coaching athletes, like the three big reasons 
people stop powerlifting are kind of major career changes or changes in life where they just aren't as interested in the sport. You get married, you have a kid, you, you move, uh, you know, you have less free time. That's kind of out of your hands as a coach, but the two things you do have control over are um, burnout and risk of injury. And those are kind of the things that I'm, I'm always watching out for. So speaking of managing the, the psychology of your clients and kind of being aware of these early lead indicators, can you talk to us about how you manage your own psychology in your own day? Um, Cause I, I know you've like, you've talked about having gone through quite a lot over the last few years and you're very candid about that. Um, and especially the, the thing that we were talking about actually last week on the podcast was emotional management as a coach mm-hmm. when you've just got no boundaries for your day. And so you have to be as clear with your own boundaries um, as you would if you were in employment with an organization because otherwise Parkinson's law takes effect and you end up just working into all times of the day. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you mean my own emotional management as an athlete or kind of my own coach management? So this is you in terms of like how you, how you structure your day. Uh, I know you've got, you've got multiple staff at this point and um, how you kind of set up your day so that you can create content, deliver the coaching to clients, do your marketing and how does that all fit together for you? And what's a day in the life? Yeah, I'm not, I don't think I'm a role model when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, I, I have kind of like a, an end of the day and I have a beginning of the day. Um, but outside of that, um, I would love to do a better job when it comes to, okay, these are the hours that are devoted to content creation. And these are the hours that are our clients. And, you know, this is when I interface with the coaches and I'd love to systematize more of that kind of stuff, but now it's just kind of like work hours and get everything done, make sure the athletes are taken care of um, when I've, when I've promised them and, and, and then just kind of, you know, restart on the next day and, and uh, just kind of have a list of projects and check those off slowly over time. But I'm absolutely prone to um, focusing more on the new shiny thing, like the new article or, or, you know, spending way too much time on one thing and just letting everything else just kind of um, take a back burner. And that's not the way that it should be. And I recognize that and I still haven't fixed it. So um, I know kind of what one should do, but I'm certainly not a role model when it comes to that. I think everyone feels that way to a degree. I think no matter, like to yeah. be honest, the fact that you have a start and end to the day, I think probably puts you in like the top <laughs> five, 10% of, of people who work for themselves. <laughs> Um, yeah. How do you, yeah. how do you manage like being, cause something we've not mentioned, right. Is you're reasonably competitive when it comes to, to powerlifting, right? Like you've done. Yeah. Really, okay. I'm, yeah. I'm working <laughs> on it. <laughs> so Bryce came first in, for those people who don't know what, what powerlifting federations are. Can you give us like the briefest summary, Bryce? Of like the yep like so the um, IPF and the what that international means. powerlifting federation the IPF is kind of like the the international governing body so if if anyone was to if powerlifting was an Olympic sport you know imagine um, the athletes who did well at the IPF would go on to the Olympics and then each uh, nation has its own uh, federation as well that feeds into that larger organization so USA powerlifting is our national organization. And you in 2018 won the world championships within the IPF. I did. Yeah, correct. Cool. So I think a lot of people would look at that and think there's probably a fairly a good amount of commitment with that. A lot of people associate running your own business or being your own boss is also quite a lot to, to juggle in terms of there's no boundaries to your day. So how do you, how do you manage those two things? Do you have set times that you train or ways that you manage? I do. Teams? Yeah, the, the uncompromising training times has been a really uh, important thing for me, you know, so no matter what's going on, nothing gets scheduled after like 3.30 p.m. for me because training starts at 4.30 and, you know, it's going to go till 7.30 and, and just kind of being very uncompromising with that um, has been really important. So, you know, it, I stop work at right around 3.30 or something like that. And then if I have anything uh, that I haven't finished up, that's really, really important. I can do it when I come home, but, but just kind of setting aside those two things and training away from home um, has been really nice. So sometimes people aren't afforded that luxury and you have a home gym and, and that's kind of a whole separate set of problems. But 
if you can, going somewhere to train uh, helps further separate that boundary in between. This is my day job coaching, and this is my um, my hobby, my powerlifting. Because you Sounds used like to train you- and work in the same. I think I remember when you were working with us more recently, you had like a, a, a basement that had a gym and an office in, right? Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah, exactly right. And yeah. you kind of have to be clear on your boundaries and say, okay, well, no email, no email while I'm training, you know, just if it yeah. takes uninstalling it from your phone or whatever, that's, that's what it takes. But I can certainly see sort of when I walk over there, I'm not working when it's like five meters away is where you worked all day. Right. It's, it's hard, hard to create that boundary. Yeah. It seems like having just the simple rules <clears throat> that actually your, your day sounds like at least you, if there is chaos, you can control it by just having start time, end time. And really, yeah, as Johnny said, like that, that puts you into the, the top 1% because you can't really go too far wrong once, once there's mm-hmm. defined windows, um, unless mm-hmm. you're just on Pornhub the whole time in those windows. But, <laughs> but yeah, like, I think that's, that's fantastic. You spend three hours it's, training. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's getting there. That's training, you know, that's getting back home and, and, um, I train a little bit faster than that, but my training partner uh, has longer sessions. And so um, it just kind of uh, extends a little bit. Parkinson's law taking effect. Sure. So it takes quite a while to like work up to a 300 kilo squat though, right? Like that's not, that's not, well, no, like I, I, I really like taking short rest periods and I've, I've had to like put a timer on my phone to just make me sit for five minutes. Wow. Um, yeah. But I like uh, going quicker. It's the, the nerves interesting so you've when you are training presumably you document quite a lot of it like i've seen your training logs and they are like just the the amount of setup with the cameras and and lights and everything does that detract from your training or is it kind of like you've got a process now you set it up and then you just focus on the work good question so we back when gyms kind of first closed in February or something like that, we, we quickly set up a home gym. We borrowed one of the combo racks from Elevate Barbell. You know, we built a rubber platform and we started streaming on Twitch and you know, we had like studio lights and this green screen and, and multiple camera angles. And we were talking with chat uh, all while trying to train. And it was, it was a lot. And, you know, I kind of finished the training session being like, what happened? You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> and and that was too much so so now you know it's just a camera there's no lights or anything like that and, and that all feels very automatic now I just set up a camera point it at my lift and and do the lift so we were talking about your your blue yeti the uh the black microphone that um that you got bef- well you, you say after it was cool but i, I guess uh, you were, you were on the upswing of that your production quality has always been really really good <clears throat> and i think this minimizes the friction for people. Even I imagine you've probably got some subscribers that aren't even powerlifters, but just watch your videos because they're so beautiful. Um, and this is, I think it's a big barrier for people creating content. Mm-hmm. Do you have any advice for improving your production quality without having to become a full-time videographer? Yeah, um, man, I'm really passionate about this. I, I, um, I can tell. I love cinematography. It's just, it's beautiful to me. And, and, you know, there's some, some great YouTube rabbit holes you can go down that kind of teach you all this information, but, um, here's, here's a few easy things. So because almost everything you're going to be filming is going to be consumed on a phone, you don't have to worry about getting like a a $4,000 camera or something like that. So get something that films maybe 1080p or 2k, which at this point is like a few generations past and you can get that really, really affordably from there get a camera with an interchangeable lens. Uh, and the lens is really where people are going to see the difference in quality. So something with a low aperture, something like 1.4 or two or something like that, that gives you that nice kind of blurry background that looks really professional. Um, that's really it. Uh, that makes a dramatic difference in, um, in what you're doing. Then watch one or two videos on um, film composition. So how to structure a frame and you're good to go. Wow. Sound sound really doesn't even worry. Uh, it doesn't even matter for, for training stuff unless you're doing like voiceovers, in which case a microphone like the one all three of us are using will satisfy all your needs and, and you'll be good to go. Yeah. So I think with, with sound, like as long as you've got a decent enough microphone, you're spending a hundred dollars or more on a mic, 
then I think like there's probably limited benefit to going for a thousand dollar directional mic and everything. But mm -hmm. bad sound, I feel like personally puts me off a video quicker than bad video. Um, mm -hmm. If it's a grainy video, but the sound is, is listenable, great. But if there's like background noise and a hiss or it's sounds like it's, it's distant, then I can't really tolerate watching something like that, even if the content is great. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's kind of two ways to solve this. If you're in a, in a noisy gym, one is the on camera shotgun mics. They just kind of point in the direction that the camera's pointing. And the other is um, wireless lavalier mics and road makes one that's $200 that um, makes you sound really good. And you can use it with your, your phone. If you want, you just hook it right up into your iPhone or you can plug it into a camera as well. So it's pretty multi-purpose also. How much of that do you think contributed to your YouTube growth? Um, that's like, a good question. The difference from when you like upgraded the production value in terms of subscriber growth and that kind of thing. No, it really didn't make much of a difference for me. Um, but that was probably my own doing. So YouTube was, was growing really well. And then I got very disinterested in it and basically didn't post anything for a year. And no matter how good the stuff is, when you return, it just, you, you lose a lot of attention when you kind of don't keep this going on a regular basis. So if anything, if there's a lesson to be learned there, it's, it's that regularity is more important than actual quality of, of, of at least the, the production quality. Right. Interesting. What, what's the, cause the, I guess the typical rule of thumb is one video a week. Would mm -hmm. you agree with that? Yeah, I would, I would say so. So as a, as a consumer of content, uh, it's always nice to kind of see stuff on a regular basis, like once a week and it kind of, keeps a channel or a person at the top of my mind and I'm kind of always able to come back and, and learn something new. There's kind of the trade-off between if you do really frequent content, it's probably going to be a bit crap. Whereas if you really like perfectionism central on every video and it takes you a month to release it, then there's going to be too much of a dip in interest each time. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's some, you know, blend in there that works best for each individual person. You know, if you can't get a video done once a week, well, that's fine. Or maybe release your videos in seasons, you know, so I say, this is kind of my season. So you film kind of a, a lot of stuff all at once. You have a season and then you kind of have a break and then you, you do another thing with a season. Oh, that kind of thing nice. is getting more popular with podcasts as well. So do you have any advice for um, new coaches that want to start creating content? Like, do you think doing the training video log is the way to go for everyone? Or is that kind of because of your strength as an athlete that um, that was the, the most obvious thing for you? Like what kind of style of content do you think is, is the best thing for someone starting out? It really has to resonate with you specifically. Yeah. You know, so it's, there's some element of kind of forcing it at the beginning just because it feels foreign that you might have to do just to kind of, try something new but outside of that it has to be something you want to do and you kind of feel passionate about there's a there's a few different ways you can approach this you know one is create the pieces of content that you would have loved to have had when you first started um, so what are the things that uh, athletes like you would have needed to know another one is just speak from personal experience speak about your personal experience with lifting or with coaching or with working with athletes or anything like that that's a really powerful lens that that you can look from um, beware, beware, beware the, um, uh, the effect of thinking that you're an imposter. So it can be one thing to, to look around and see guys like Jeff Nippert on YouTube and, and how like insanely high the production quality is on there and think, well, shit, why, like why should I even try? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's incredible. So when you see guys like that, try not to think, well, why should I even try? you just have to start, you know, and, and, um, kind of putting your head down and, and maybe even putting on some blinders and saying, look, I feel passionate about this. Let me just get it out there. And people want to listen to it from me because I have something unique to say rather than it being the definitive source on how to squat or something like that. It's a, it's very, very dangerous because you're constantly seeing what everyone else is producing. And this is the same thing with being an athlete and looking around at what everyone else's is, is training looks like on a regular basis. Um, that's that's a flow of information that you can turn off if you want and uh, it might be healthy at times such an interesting point because yeah like not not only so for example the instagram feed is the kind of the, the the pinnacle of that because it's so visual and everyone's showing the highlight reel and making their life look so cool and mm -hmm. all the food's really aesthetic and everyone's got these like oiled shredded physiques that they <laughs> clearly like yeah. don't actually walk around with day to day 
Um, and so that's very anxiety inducing in terms of just constant comparison. And then a level up from that is when you're trying to then create something and you're like, Oh God, like, why should I, why should I even bother? And so, yeah, you're, it totally makes sense to put the blinkers on, cut out a lot of the stuff that's not, that's not helping you and just focus on creating the content that you wish was there. Mm -hmm. Cause Jeff must have like a, a TV studio and a, and a film crew. Like there's no, yeah, he, a, a lot of the things that you see are actually like sets that he's created in his house. Oh um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to, to give him credit, you know, it's, it's weird to think about, but he, he just passed 2 million subscribers on YouTube, yeah. which is uh, quite an accomplishment for someone in the fitness space who's putting out actual information rather than just, you know, shredded apps or something like that. So, that, so that's what's most impressive. I think is the, the quality of his information and mm -hmm. the reach that it's had is, as you say, it's, you, it's you, pretty you cool. tend not to see those two things together. It tends to be kind of niche following, very evidence-based, lots of science, um, but not very much reach. It's very rare. You see that expand to the level that he has is awesome to see, but yeah, I mean, it makes sense that he's not filming that lying on a sofa from his phone in one take is he like there's there's clearly no. some some effort gone into it yeah there's there's a there's a team going on there for sure yeah so just to to change subject a little bit bryce so i think the thing that uh stands out to me when i look at tsa at least this is i mean tell me if this has changed but as you say so before you have a team of of coaches right so you have more than one coach working in under the same brand mm -hmm. so what was it that led to that was it reaching capacity yourself was it predicting scale? Like, how did you arrive at the decision of, I need to have more than just me here working in this? Uh, it was demand uh, at first, you know, so we just, uh, well, I just at the time had a more interest than I had ability to, to work with. And the idea of wanting to bring on more people was, was both about kind of, um, taking care of, of more athletes than, than I could, but also about bringing new ideas into our company and, and just kind of having more perspectives and, and stuff like that. And that's been really nice. Awesome. And is that, I mean, so the, that's how the four of us coaches sure. now, um, we don't, we don't program the exact same way. Um, we kind of all have a set of guiding principles and every once in a while, someone will say, Hey, I've been doing this. This has been really effective for my athletes. And we'll all be like, Oh, well, you know, kind of put them on, on the grill for a second and, and critique the idea. And then if it seems like something worthwhile, then we kind of all start adopting it slowly. Cool. Yeah. And it's, it's, that's, I, I mean, that that's how 3DMJ is structured too, right? Like they have a similar, I imagine that that's where the thought process maybe originally came from. I think so. They are, they're pretty unique in that they started off as four buddies uh, who were bodybuilders and they actually started off as I think, like um, an online blog about bodybuilding competition. So go to a bodybuilding competition, document it, and then post a blog about it. And then, and then they started the coaching company, but they really haven't added coaches outside of uh, Andrea Valdez, who I guess is now more of like a, um, a manager than an actual coach. So do you have a, like a limit yourself? This is a question we're asked a lot is like how many clients, because I imagine right now it's all of your coaching is a one-to-one -one coaching. So someone signs up with you, or well, I think you have Skype pack, like one-off sites packages and things like that. But the, the, the most of your coaching is I sign up with a TSA coach and I'm working with them one-to-one -one in some capacity. Mm -hmm. So do you have a, yeah. a, a cap where you say, I'm going to work with this many people for this reason, because this takes me this long or is it more fluid? I have a, a pretty hard cap of less than 20 right now. I used to be a lot more than that. And uh, I, I felt like I wasn't able to do anything besides coach. Uh, and that was, you know, creating content or, you know, uh, creating more opportunities for TSA or scheduling podcasts or anything like that. And I, I realized that I need to be a coach, but I also need to kind of be a CEO of TSA and kind of, um, in some senses, direct, direct us toward the things that we want to be more like and, and stuff like that. Um, so I've, I've reduced the number of athletes that I personally coach and, uh, that's been a lot more helpful and, and, 
you don't get to that point unless you make a few mistakes of working with too many athletes and seeing, oh my God, my response times are slipping. I'm not able to give these athletes as much attention as I should be. Um, and you can, you can either carry on in that, that fashion or you can, you can make some changes. That's the evolution of it. I guess when you started, you were getting trickle of demand up to a point where you were really maxed out you then hire on hire new coaches and you then delimit the demand once again. So I imagine the, the approach to pricing and marketing must have changed as well um, as that's happened. Now that you've got more capacity for clients, do you have an active like marketing funnel or is it all just kind of like, do, do you have clear calls to action or um, email opt-in where you pitch coaching or does it just kind of happen as a result of the momentum from your following? We, um, I guess about six months ago or something like that, Danny took on the task. Danny is one of the coaches um, with us. He took on the task of Facebook marketing. So we don't do a whole lot, but we kind of have a regular ad um, that's up there and, and he kind of monitors where the traffic is coming from and every once in a while changes the targeted cities and, and what the ad says. But uh, we put a little bit back into marketing as well. And, and otherwise it's kind of through the content that we create. So trying to put out helpful resources and saying, Hey, we also do coaching um, as well. And that model of give, 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 take, I think has been very effective for, for us and also for fitness in general. Is your website alone, like the free resources on your website, there's a ton of them, right? Some really valuable, like stuff you put a lot of time into as well. Yeah. Um, that's, that's both because like, we love trying to help people. And also we think, Hey, you know, if, if you enjoy this, you'll probably enjoy working with us too. So we got some free training approaches up there that, that stand on their own and something that you could probably run for a year or so and make some pretty good progress on. Um, but also, you know, occasional articles about things that, uh, we're interested in and, uh, resources on how to use Excel. And there's this really cool, um, emailed series uh, called the athletes performance toolkit. So once a week you get kind of like a, a little bit of writing and then a question for you to chew on about um, sports psychology kind of, of uh, topics. And uh, I really enjoyed putting that together last year. Yeah. I mean, your Excel work price is, is second to none in this industry, in my opinion. So uh, well, maybe thanks. Mike, maybe Mike to share, maybe. <laughs> well, he, quite he's pretty, but he's in a, another level in that he's switched to web-based and I think that's pretty yeah. damn cool. So we're, we're trying to make that bridge as well. Um, slowly. So, um, Excel is awesome, but if you are out there and you have any software developer friends, um, make sure they stay really good friends and see if you can have them produce something for you because that I think will help you stand out from everyone else right now. I think if I'm looking at kind of trends going forward, um, the companies who get away from Google Sheets or Excel or something like that really start to look more professional. I think what the challenge... Think of, sorry, sorry, Johnny, go I think ahead. We're probably about to ask the same question. I was going to say, <laughs> like, I think the challenge is, especially from we, what we've seen from the, like, the, the stock apps that are available now that are semi-customizable, it's quite hard to deliver exactly what you want. When you look at, like, Mike's gone out there and basically made his own web app. That's part mm -hmm. of his, part of his website, which is which is brilliant, to be honest. Um, do you yeah, think that's what amazing. it takes? Do you think it's like people are going to be making their own apps to compete with this, rather than using Trainer Eyes or True Coach or something like that? Well, a while ago I looked around and I didn't really see anything that I felt like I could shift our athletes to. Mm -hmm. And you're right; they're just kind of they're not uh, for for the level of detail that we put into coaching for powerlifting specifically. Uh, I don't think it fits the bill for bodybuilding. I'm guessing it probably would cover most of your bases. You probably want a little bit more attention to nutrition and, and macros and tracking stuff like that. But the exercise side of it could probably suffice in a lot of these, these apps. But um, I'm hoping that something comes along that really is a solution and that we don't have to create it ourselves, or at least if we create it, we want everyone to use it because it worked so well for us. We want to have other people use it too. Um, so yeah, ultimately, ultimately I, I would love that for the industry, you know, something that isn't Excel that kind of, uh, functions best for everyone. This is going to sound really sales pitchy, but, um, <laughs> I, I want, 
I envision a product that combines all the different things that we have to do, the marketing, the accounting aspect, the communication with athletes and the programming. Um, and if you can do that before anyone else and do it better than anyone else, you've got something that's very, very valuable. Oh yeah, totally agree. And it, I think we're at the precipice of that. Like looking at all of the main, so I, I went through and looked at all the main kind of competitors of these uh, different, you know, PT distinction and my strength book and PT herb and all those different ones. And they all seem to be converging very closely now to mm. a final product. And I think we'll probably mm -hmm. see a market leader emerge within a year or two. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. As you said, handles like the payment processing and the delivery and the email automations and the programming and everything. And, and none of them that we've seen quite matches up to what we actually would need for a, for a client or they're really bloated, which is even worse. <laughs> you know, they, they try mm -hmm. and deliver too many features, but um, there's definitely a need that's still not quite filled, but I think it's really getting there. And yeah, um, yeah I think it's, you're right. It's going to game. It's going to change the industry because once that's the case, Excel will just seem so antiquated that yeah. we'll all be on that. Yeah. I mean, something as simple as like, if you could drag and drop an exercise onto a different day, like my mind would be blown, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. Instead of cut, cutting yeah. and pasting rows in Excel. <laughs> yeah. Like it's not, I don't think we're asking for much, are we? It's not like this thing that we're not, we're not creating the next Spotify or something like very advanced. Like it should be yeah. technically very, quite simple. Um, yeah. I, but agree with you. I suppose it, you're because right, it's, the, the developers tend not to be lifters and that's where it kind of mm -hmm. doesn't match up. Like the best mm -hmm. um, training tool that I've used has been heavy set for iPhone and that's because the developer is a lifter. It just, you know, it just makes so much more sense because then they understand the problem and they are building it rather than someone who's then trying to liaise with a developer and have a project management and all this stuff. Like it's, you know, it's, it's direct from the horse's mouth. Yeah. I think Bryce, I think has made the, the smart decision. And I think uses Gravitas instead of having set. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. I, I've been <laughs> using Gravitas. Gravitas is, is nice. I keep trying to tell you stuff, but he's. I, so I downloaded assist. it the other day. Not, not Don't as good like as it. Set. I think that's just your own bias. It's sacrilege. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gravitas has, has its own problem. So if, if Gravitas, uh, if the owners are listening, um, you can't, you can't schedule in, uh, RPE sets. Uh, you can only schedule in load based sets. So you can say, this is my training for today. And you can only put in loads. You can't say, well, I have a, a triple at RPE seven. And that seems like an easy fix. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, isn't it? Where I remember we chatted to a friend who is a developer about, we have a, a macro calculator on, on our website. It's just like a free resource. Mm -hmm. And we were chatting to him about like, Oh, we want to change this. Um, it may have been something, but it, the conversation was basically selecting a number or putting a number into a field in an app. And he was selecting it as like a, a, a wheel that you roll to, to select the number and then another wheel that you roll. And we were like, mm -hmm. why can't that just be digital input? Like, why can't that just be a calculator input? And he then just went on for five minutes about why that's a lot more complicated <laughs> than we understand. And that's when you, yeah. just, you take a step into the, the world of actually building these things. And you're like, right, mm. that's why. <laughs> it's, not, it's not just that they can't be bothered. There's a lot yeah. of the time they are looking at all, a lot of new features that are very advanced. It's probably the same as like when someone comes to you and they're like, oh, um, I just want to look like, you know, Brad Pitt in Fight Club. And you're like, oh, okay, like, and they don't realize that that's not just like a, a throwaway <laughs> comment. You're like, right, you don't, there's so much that's just not possible about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the final thing I want to ask you, Bryce, uh, which is also something we get asked a lot. So um, I think people, when they move, when they think about online fitness, they often think about like the, the one secret that doctors don't want you to know about that's the secret to weight loss, right? That kind of very mm -hmm. traditional marketing, um, which may work for a, a, a portion of the industry. Um, but when you're trying to sell to very like aware markets, I suppose, so strength athletes or people who are involved in strength sports or uh, any kind of serious gym goer, they're, they're wise to anything like that. And so there's not that, you know, marketing can't, be done in the way that a lot of people would traditionally teach it. So do you have mm -hmm. any advice for kind of pricing or, and I realize this is a difficult question, but do you have any advice for pricing or selling to that market, to markets who are perhaps even looking for like a way to do it themselves, if that makes sense, or a way to coach themselves or 
any experience or advice for that? Yeah, the, the, there's a few pieces to that. You talked about kind of marketing and creating content, and then you also talked about pricing and price structures. Mm -hmm. um, which of those do we want to go down? <laughs> uh, let's talk about marketing. Okay. Uh, when you kind of in, in the line of what we talked about earlier with creating content, um, you have to be really true to yourself and, and what you believe in. Cause I think people can sniff out bullshit very quickly and sniff out when something is just kind of created for clicks or likes or, you know, 10 things, 10 things, blah, blah, blah. Um, so just speaking from the heart, speaking from personal experience, um, is really valuable. And, and, you know, that can be professionally produced, you know, you can have a nice camera behind it and still talk uh, in, in the same kind of colloquial way that you would be talking to a best friend or, or something like that. I think that kind of thing is really good. And then I'm, I'm personally a fan of evidence based stuff wherever possible as well. So saying, well, I got this idea, but this is kind of what the evidence says. And, and that, that has a dual purpose of both educating uh, and also putting you in a halo effect of saying, well, this is a coach that knows what they're talking about because they've done their research. That's someone who I want to work with. Um, and I think that kind of thing is, is a really good thing as well. On the pricing side, it can be uh, very alluring to kind of price yourself overly affordable in, in a way that you'd have to take on, you know, 70 clients just to, to make a living or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, do some market research and take a look at what, uh, coaches are charging kind of across the spectrum uh, from the highest level down to the lowest level and price yourself in a way that you feel like you aren't, uh, you know, price gouging someone or taking advantage of someone, but also something that values your services as well. And set yourself a, a unit of time that you would kind of review that price structure and say, is this, is this good? Um, is this preventing me from getting more athletes or is this supporting me getting more athletes? Um, or am I getting the right amount of business that, that I want out of that kind of thing? And, um, and yeah, just kind of continuously keep an eye on, on what the market is based. So, uh, when I first started, I took a look around and I, I priced myself below what other coaches were, um, charging, but not by a whole lot, something that might seem like, uh, if you were kind of price shopping and comparing, you'd see TSA and think that it it's uh, a bargain. Uh, but not that it's so low, you're kind of scratching your head and thinking what's, what's going on here. What's wrong here. There has to be a catch. Mm -hmm. Um, so hitting that balance isn't uh, a trivial task, but I think it's something worthwhile. Yeah. I think definitely yeah. pricing is a, because you can't like, with coaching, buying a coach, you can't like pick something up and feel it and look at it in a shop. You have to make an assessment based on signals of quality. And I think price mm -hmm. can definitely be one of good or bad can be one of those signals. But yeah. yeah, I think staying staying realistic and competitive is there's certainly a move in the industry in general to price higher and higher. I would say not in the not in the strength sports part of the industry, but in the fitness industry online in general, some of the numbers mm -hmm. are, are extortionately high. Um I think it does. You see it in powerlifting a little bit uh, here and there. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's probably a bad thing to price yourself high and then have to drop them because you, you miss the mark on the high side. Mm -hmm. So famous example, Boris Shaiko actually, um, just started doing online coaching for the first time. I, I forget when this was, wow. but priced himself at, um, 400 bucks a month. And, uh, I guess didn't get the business that he wanted because I saw him reduce his prices at some point um, down to some, some lower level. And so that kind of sends this, this signal of whoops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's no, there's no easier way to say to the market that didn't work. Yeah. Is there? Yeah. yeah. I tried this. Not very many people wanted it. So I'm having to <laughs> change my strategy. Yeah. So I suppose right. someone like that probably looks at it and thinks, you know, with my, with my brand and with the name, that in certainly in powerlifting, probably a lot of people have heard of, I could probably get away with that pricing. And even that mm -hmm. is, a, is having to adapt to the, how available some, because the other thing that I think is the case with, with the powerlifting world is some people are doing it for free or for very, very low prices mm -hmm. with like yeah. weekly programming done over, as we spoke about at the beginning, you know, you'll get like a programming written in WhatsApp once a week. That's clearly been made up on the spot all the way through to web apps and, you know, video responses. So there's a, there is a full spectrum of services to pick from. Mm -hmm, true. Yeah. All right. Any more questions, Yusuf, or 
I think we're no, I think we, our list. We we went round the round the full wheel round of, the houses. of coaching there. That was, uh, <laughs> it was fantastic. But it's yeah. it's also great, Bryce, to to speak to you five years on. Like I think thing and seeing the way that things have moved for both of us. Um, I remember I was in my first or second year of med school speaking to you, um, and we were in a very different stage in our training journey. I think where where our businesses are as well. Mm. Um, and it's really cool to to touch base and see yeah. where things have gone and what the lessons we've learned are. I'd love to 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 flip the script here and do an interview of you guys too. I feel like there's so much uh, that's changed for you guys, and I'd love to to hear about that. Oh man, we'd we'd love to. Yeah. Are you asking that question now, Royce? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do another hour. Let's do a whole, uh, whole hour. I was like, wow, he's just fully. No, yeah. No. But yeah, absolutely, man. That'd be that'd be good. Yeah, I'd love that. Cool. All right, bro. We'll, we'll, well, yeah, we'll we'll be in touch for um some dates that we can we can have a chat. That'd be amazing. That'd be awesome. Where can guys? Thank you so much for having Bryce me. in their lives. Where do they go to find out more Bryce things? Um, I I took a one month break from social media, but I'm currently back on as I'm working on this um really big charity project that we're going to be doing in mid September. Um. But you can find our coaching on thestrengthathlete.com and you can find me on Instagram at Bryce underscore TSA. And uh, stay tuned for this charity project. Um, so basically, I'm bringing a lot of high-level athletes to Fort Collins and we're going to do a bunch of lifts and powerlifting jeopardy and family feud and, and stuff like that while people watch on Twitch and donate for charity. That sounds nice. Awesome. That sounds like a good initiative. Yeah. Just stay yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. You'll be posting about it on, on social media, right? So follow Bryce for sure we're just waiting for a few more confirmations before we make it official awesome that sounds good all right Bryce thanks so much for coming on great to chat to you all right thank you guys so much speak soon